in a country far, far away, tons of new information from hands-on gameplay with Star Wars Outlaws has dropped, including, and thank goodness for this, a much deeper look at the reputation system that I've said I think will be the linchpin of whether or not this game is truly remarkable. So what's going on, guys and girls? It's Ghost Robo. We are back talking SWO, SWO, SWO in Sweden where Game Informer went for exclusive hands-on. They are the first people to play Star Wars Outlaws, which is kind of crazy considering the game is out in four months. I'm expecting previews to ramp up really quickly for this game, but this being the first, man, like, we got to talk all about it. Let me know what you think in the comments down below if this stuff sounds good or bad to you. I personally think it sounds really good, but Ubisoft, like, that's always going to be the thing. In the back of my head, um, we'll kick it off with a few things I found interesting lore-wise. So Ubisoft and Massive have made creatures, characters, factions, and planets. So most of the demo took place on Toshara, which is a new moon created uh, in collaboration with Lucasfilm. Everything they create is in collaboration with Lucasfilm, so that's basically letting you know that the Star Wars people are giving it their seal of approval. It does get great from here, though. The capital city of Toshara is Miragana, and Miragana is a dense city. Now, I love what Ubisoft has to say here, what Massive has to say, because they say if you open up the map, the location that we built for Miragana is quite compact. What we wanted to do is have something that is very dense in activities rather than super expansive where you get lost, and there's not much to do. It's very, very focused on providing a dense, busy city experience. Thank you! This is what I noticed in the earlier trailers, that rather than just having sprawling spaces with not much going on, it did seem like there was a heavy emphasis on animation and liveliness and just density of their single-player world. And that's something that true single-player great games emphasize and focus on, and it's something that oftentimes open-world games lose out and miss. They'll have a huge world that feels dead. They'll have a huge world that has barely anything going on. They'll have a huge world with tons and tons of quests, but it feels like you're just kind of wandering around accomplishing nothing. It's great to hear that the team and the creative director, Julianne Garrity, wants to focus on density. That's what makes Dead Space great. That's what makes Naughty Dog games great. That's what makes Bioshock great. It's these spaces that may not be humongous, but they're so jam-packed. So going on to the gameplay elements of their demo, Game Informer talks about how the reputation system seems to be at the center of everything. And thank goodness gracious. So we're going to get some good details on how factions play out here. And we also get information on who the leaders in the game for each faction are. Uh, Slero is the Zarek Besh leader. We've got Gorak, who is the Pikes leader. We've got newly listed Lady Kira, who is the... Crimson Dawn leader, and you may remember her from the Solo movie, and Queen Ashiga is the Ashiga clan leader, which, again, the Ashiga clan is the newly created faction from Massive that has some striking resemblance to uh, Japanese samurai, at least in their armor, and the queen aspect does make it seem like it's going to be a faction that sort of trades in the more, um, you know, uh, antiquated historical kind of ways of the world. But the reputation system ranges from terrible to excellent, and you can move up this track. So there should be many different steps and layers. And these reputation levels are going to dictate how freely you can walk into the syndicate hideouts, how much special stock they offer you at their shops, how much of a discount they offer you at shops in their territories, and they can help you out if you get into hairy situations with another syndicate or the empire. Now, this last line is the most just airy-fairy, right? Like, what does this mean? They can help you out. Does this mean that there's dynamic instances where a Pike member, if you have excellent standing, is going to drop in to Tatooine and fend off the Empire while you escape? Does this just mean that the Empire is going to put out a wanted notice for you and then someone from the Pike Syndicate's going to come over the, the airwave and say, oh, we, you know, we hacked the system and got rid of the one. Like, how much is this going to play? And I think that this article, this gameplay demo really illustrates that they've got the micro level of the reputation system down pat. You know, it affects different things you can buy. It affects different prices. It affects different dialogue. It affects different ways that you can interact. And, and we'll see later on in the demo, um, or they saw later on, unfortunately we don't have video of this demo, that 
they got a piece of intelligence and they had to decide whether to give it to the Crimson Dawn or to the Pikes and their reputation moved accordingly. And the reputation is more nuanced than just that black and white, do you give it to them, do you don't? Because as they infiltrated the Pike hideout, they set off an alarm and that lowered their reputation where they were told if they did not set off the alarm, their reputation at the Pike Syndicate would have stayed the same. So there's much more than just a story decision. There's much more than just you know, it seems like it's going to be more than just up, down. You do have to sort of, your gameplay, I guess, rather dictates how this reputation works. But does it have a larger impact? Is there a meta impact? Is there a grander story impact? Is it just that, oh, you give it to the Crimson Dawn, so now you get Crimson Dawn points. You give it to the Pikes, you get Pike points. Is that going to play in later in the game? Will there be, you know, now Gorak comes back and says like, dude, you gave that to Lady Kira. I'm not happy with that. I'm barring you from this mission. Or, you know, is the Crimson Dawn going to reward you with a better upgrade for your blaster because you gave it to them, whereas if you gave it to the Pikes, they would have given you, I don't know, some new armor for Nyx, your, your little sidekick. I hope that there is more than just the like plus one minus one because that's how I feel Far Cry ends up being and this is Ubisoft and Far Cry is a thing. I'm going to try to not always compare it to Far Cry because I know it's its own game and I know Massive is trying to do their own thing and you know Massive doesn't make Far Cry so let's give them the benefit of the doubt. But when you start talking about factions, I just want to make sure that there is more than a binary yes, no, one, zero, and more of a meta impact than just micro. Uh, I do like the idea that you can get deeper into hideouts without triggering alarms, depending on your reputation. They talk about at one point, they need to steal a part from either the Crimson Dawn or the Pikes for their blaster. And it actually sounds like this is an interesting mechanic where your upgrades are gonna be more about finding like completing missions and finding the parts to upgrade rather than just a skill tree. Um, that's something I heard recently referenced in Ken Levine's talks about Judas that like your upgrades in that game are going to be very much mission driven. Like, oh, you want to upgrade your shotgun? You got to go do the mission for the shotgun. And, and I like that. I like that it's more integrated in the world and it has more of a immersive believability than just like, oh, pick the dot on the, the skill tree. So you get to pick if you want to go to the, the Crimson Dawn, the Pikes. They say that you got to decide, you know, if your reputation is better with the Pikes, you can get deeper into the Pike Syndicate, but they might be more pissed off and then lower your reputation. So you got to kind of weigh these things. And I do hope that the overall balance is much more Fallout-esque where like, you know, your favor with one is going to end up creating problems with the other and maybe even different missions. Like I would love if by hour 12 of this game, I can't get this Pike mission because I've pissed off Gorak too much. I can get this Crimson Dawn mission and I can get this Hut Cartel mission, but you know, the Ashiga clan, if I don't do this one, they're going to, you know, lock me out. I would love it if they locked you out of certain things. I don't know, and if I had to guess, I don't think they will do that, but it would be cool. Um, we do know that the Gorak scene shown off in the story trailer is scripted. That is a set moment that's described in this demo where Kay does go make a bad joke to Gorak. He kicks her out. Nick steals his ring, and that allows them to, to have some leverage. So that is very scripted. Um, I talked about in my deep dive video that I was hopeful maybe like, oh, because you were kicked out, it was because your reputation was too low. I don't know if major characters and major NPCs, major story beats are going to factor your reputation in, but let's leave reputation for a bit and talk more about the blaster. So one of the more interesting things I thought about this hands-on demo was that there are certain sections where the blaster is off limits. Now, I find this to be very interesting and I'm curious what you think if, if you would deem this a negative. So apparently in early portions of hideout infiltrations when you're trying to sneak in and steal stuff from one of the syndicates, Kay's blaster is off limits. So you are forced to use stealth early on. You're forced to rely on Nyx with sort of like, oh, go, you know, knock this over, go take out this guard until you get deeper into the territory. Now, here's my guess. I bet that they do this so you cannot just trigger the alarm right away and cause all of the guards to come flowing out of the hideout. I think that would be for boring gameplay and maybe even frustrating that one mistake early on causes the entire hideout to basically collapse. These hideouts seem to take a large chunk of the gameplay in relation to how you interact with the syndicates and the reputation system. So if you were either able or accidentally triggered an alarm very early on, the whole syndicate rushes out. It either creates 
a weird story moment where like, why aren't they coming? Why do they not care that I'm blasting away at the, you know, the first level of their hideout? Or it creates frustration that, well, now I just wasted this whole hideout. So you can't use your blaster. Ah, I don't like that personally, but I hope that the gameplay reason is as I, you know, imagine and that there is a good benefit there. Um, as you get deeper into the hideouts, you can use your blaster. You can set it to stun. You can set it to kill. We've seen those different modes activated in the gameplay uh, demo from last year, and it does sound like you can still screw things up. So the demo player from Game Informer describes like they accidentally caused the guards, the pike guards, to notice where they were at, and it created a big fight with more and more enemies coming out, stronger and stronger enemies coming out. But they note that even if they didn't trip them, they screwed up because they had not uh, taken down the alarm system. And even if they had taken down the alarm system, they walked past a security camera. So like there's multiple layers here and that does seem interesting. Like they're emphasizing the stealth gameplay more than just like sneak from wall to wall and shoot or don't shoot. Clearly stealth is a huge part of an outlaw storyline. And so it makes sense that they're giving it the focus it deserves here. I like that there's three levels, right? Like you can shoot and alert guards just via your presence. There's an alarm system that you might want to take out. And then there's also security cameras that are functioning independently. Again, this notion that we don't want on off switches, we don't want ones and zeros, we want dynamic encounters. And what they describe here at the hideout seems pretty darn cool. Um, they did not get to see much of sort of how the game works from like quest to quest to space to space. They did get to do a little bit of an escape, but it sounds honestly a lot like the escape shown in the 10 minute demo. Um, they got to ride the bike and I do love this part here because they say that the bike felt great. The bike was really smooth, quick, agile, felt like a speeder should, very controllable. And I love that. I think having a great vehicle for honestly both ground and space is, is huge. And especially if you're gonna be spending a good chunk of time and that seamlessness is being touted as one of their you know awesome features, it better feel good to play. It better feel good to roll around in. And I honestly, I'm really glad that the, uh, the speeder feels great because that speeder looks sick. It can go on water, it can go on land. It looks great. Um, they talk about getting a CK ship and needing to get an item from it. Now, this is interesting as well because it shows the emphasis of the story and the missions more than just the open world. Like this is being labeled as an open world game, but it does seem like Massive is taking clear steps to make sure it is more single player than just sandbox. They also note that there's a radio with chatter that delivers uh, messages about activities you could pursue. And here is where like some of the good elements of an open world I think really do come into play and be really fun in the Star Wars universe and with the bounty hunter outlaw um, umbrella, right? Radio chatter alerted them to different activities they could pursue as they were riding around the speeder bike. So this is now giving you vibes of like crimes in the Spider-Man 1 and 2 games on PlayStation. This is giving you vibes of GTA. This is giving you vibes of like, hey, dynamic events are happening and you can react to them if you want. How that affects reputation, how that affects your your loot or your upgrades or whatnot, TBD, but it does sound promising that the game is going to try and definitely balance being a very dense game with story-driven missions, story-driven characters, and hopefully a reputation system that has severe impact as you progress through the story and your, your roles within and with the syndicates and against the syndicates and versus each other, and maybe even has some points of no return, while also having the fun of an open world and the explorability of an open world and the dynamic nature that random events can provide. So I hope that you know, the, the radio chatter and the different events you can do are very cool. I'm guessing some will be platform and traversal related. Some will be, you know, combat related. A lot will probably have to do with stealthing and stealing. It's described here that, you know, you can go to the Crimson Dawn hideout. You can go to the Pike hideout. They're clearly going to have hideouts on different planets in different cities. I do hope there's more than that. At the end of the day, they say that there's a cantina in every major area that's sort of the hub for where you'll get missions, you'll find intel, you'll talk to important characters. I do hope it's more than rinse and repeat. You know, you could have six planets where they all have a cantina, they all have hideouts, and it feels like the same thing with a different window dressing. Can Massive make the, the nature of these missions, the nature of these hideouts, the nature of what you're doing evolve and truly feel different as K progresses sort of through the Bounty Hunter world, as your reputation 
increases and decreases with these factions and as the game you know itself moves from hour one to hour 10 and beyond a lot of it i think just is going to fall on how much variety they have in there how much variety they can put in their reputation system how much have they invested in making this game feel truly dynamic now the final quote i'll just read verbatim from game informer because i think it sums things up nicely uh, i came away excited about how far you can manipulate the various systems at play in star wars outlaws massive entertainment came into the project wanting to create the ultimate scoundrel experience set in the star wars galaxy and from what i've seen and played it has a lot of important elements in place to accomplish that goal i'm more excited than ever to get my hands on the final product when it arrives on august 30th now i do think there are plenty of systems elements mission types and even just entire mechanics of this game that we have not seen, we have not heard about. You know, they talk about using the Ion Blast to take out uh, different doors and different Transformers for puzzle solving in this gameplay demo. They talk a little bit about the Rhythm Minigame to lockpick your way through certain areas. I think once we get more gameplay and see more maybe later game play, you know, like throughout the, the, the second half of the game, we'll have a better idea of like how deep does this really go. How varied is it going to feel? And is there a true progression of KVAS from, you know, pickpocketer to Boba Fett level bounty hunter? And I hope that there is in both her character and story and plot, but also in the gameplay. Thus far, though, I'm beyond smitten with this game. I'm so darn excited. I think the idea of the reputation system is just so cool. And if they can pull it off, it's going to be absolutely incredible. I love hearing about more ways that it impacts the world, impacts your encounters. And I love that, like, you could choose... Do you give this dossier to the Crimson Dawn? Do you give it to the Pike Syndicate? Your rewards will be different. Hopefully your consequences will be different. And gosh, like just, just give us more. I'll, I'll go to Sweden and play it. I'll take, I'll take one for the team. Fly me off to a country far, far away. And uh, let's figure out exactly what's going on on Kajimi and with Slero and everything else that we've seen thus far. And the hints of such an epic game coming our way in a few months. Let me know what you think of all these new details and like, you know, there's stuff that we could just even go deeper on if you'd like. We got the four leaders of the factions revealed, which is pretty sweet. We know more about Kay's, uh, her, her arsenal in terms of her lock picking, her ion blast. Nyx is going to be quite the cool character, I think. And, and by the way, Nyx is another created character. Uh, if you didn't know, that is something that they uh, originally designed, Massive originally designed for this game, um, and he seems like he's going to factor heavily into gameplay. He was an important part of this demo, but we've seen quite a bit of that. And so I, I hope that he can level up as well, um, and I hope that he is... I hope that he's not super, like, easy to use. Like, obviously we want to be easy to use to point and click where to go, but I hope there's... It's not just like, oh, look, there's a blue indicator for Nyx and click here and he'll go do the work. Like maybe there's more you have to pick from. In the demo that we saw, the visual demo last year, it did look like you had more options and choices. In the article, they describe it as being a little bit more linear, but who knows how early on in the game this is. It sounds like it's pretty early on. Um, so uh, hopefully, you know, Nyx the Murkhal, the new species they developed with Lucasfilm, like hopefully... Hopefully he's dynamic as well. I'm just praying for a dynamic Star Wars. I think we're going to get it. In the meantime, thanks so much for watching, everybody. Hope you all have a fantastic day. Drink some hot chocolate. And until next time, we'll see you all later.